Hey there friends, Dave Politis, Canada Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel and uh, this is a missing person segment. We're going to cover some letters, we're going to cover some very interesting cases and we're going to talk about some things that have come up just lately. Talked to you the other day about the number of suicides in the U.S. Navy. Breaks my heart. Parents give their young men over to the armed forces to take care of them. And they don't. This really, really bothers me as a man and as a U.S. citizen. I don't like it. I don't like it because they should be respecting our young men and treating them better than they are. And it's frustrating as all heck. So, first letter, it's actually a news article. It occurred on uh, Yahoo News, May 23rd of this year. Title is Howie Mandel, I'm taking control of his mental health. I didn't realize until later in life how important it was. Howie Mandel believes like physical fitness, mental health is a continuous work in progress. The 66-year-old host of Canada's Got Talent has been outspoken about his struggles with obsessive compulsive disorder since reaching his 40s. I didn't realize until really late in life how important mental health treatment was, he tells Yahoo Life. Up until that time, there wasn't the, the title. I thought my struggle was my normal. My Mandel calls OCD debilitating. What is it in these... Uh, intrusive thoughts. You get so obsessed with them that you can't move forward, he shares. You can't show up. You can't be productive. It's mind-boggling. Now, I bring this up to you for a couple of reasons. First of all, some of you are in the dark about mental health in the U.S. right now. It's rapidly growing, and it's growing fast. Just like how he talks about right there, taking care of your mental health. Just don't put it on the back burner. When I lost Ben, Angie immediately said, Dave, you need help. She said, you need to find yourself a counselor. Angie's one of those people I truly respect. And the next day I went out, searched online, found somebody that appeared to have the background I probably needed. For the next year and a half, I saw her. It helped me immensely. Now, counselors are tough to find. Good ones are really tough to find. And the best ones are almost impossible to find. But you need to stay the course. If you have a mental illness, if you're depressed, you need to get help. The other thing that Angie and I did was when I found out that Ben was bipolar, we looked for resources immediately. And we found NAMI, N-A-M-I. They have offices all over the United States. We enrolled in a 12-week program. We had 12 other families in there with us. And it was probably some of the best counseling I've ever had in my life. That peer support, other families going through the identical same scenario that we were going through. If you're a parent, don't think you can stand there and take it alone. If you are suffering from mental illness don't be embarrassed by it get some help I've stated before and I'll say it again I know of several professional athletes that are pretty much world famous that are bipolar and they got their condition under control with the help of seeing some really good doctors and going through that cycle of seeing what works and I hate to say it, but whatever works is better than the alternative. 
I do believe that mental illness is a thousand years behind the time of where we should be on helping people. And it doesn't look like any administration in the future is going to be willing to do it. And that's disgusting. If you have, if you have mental illness, you are not alone. Other recent celebrities that have claimed suicidal thoughts, and these are in the news. Lady Gaga made a very bold statement that she's had suicidal thoughts almost every day, and she hated being famous. Meghan Markle claimed she had suicidal thoughts while she was pregnant. Just Google that statement and you'll find Lady Gaga and Meghan Markle. But folks, that's not it. Sarah Hyland had suicidal thoughts after her kidney transplant failed. Jamila Jamil claimed she tried to take her own life six years ago. And friends, there's hundreds more just like this. Some facts I want you to think about. And if you are a family and you're looking at your son, your daughter, or your spouse, and you're, you're worried about their mental health, I've said this before, I guarantee that that person that you're thinking about has thought about taking their life. They've thought about suicide. So you bringing it up isn't going to all of a sudden say, oh my God, that's what I should do. No. You need to bring it up. Globally, this is from the World Health Organization. This is from 2019. 800,000 people die from suicide every year. That's twice the number that die from homicide. Suicide is one of the leading causes of death of young people. 1.4% of global deaths in 2017 were from suicide. 1.4%. In some countries, this is as high as 5%. Suicide rates are typically higher in older individuals. Globally, the suicide rate for men is twice as high as for women. In many countries, this ratio is even higher. Suicide rates from firearms are particularly high in the US. 60% of deaths from firearms result from suicide. Self-poisoning from pesticides have had a large toll, particularly in low to middle class income countries. One person dies from suicide around the world every 40 seconds. And that person who took their life will have a destructive tendency on their family. I guarantee it. And I know many people who have had suicidal thoughts don't think about the impact on their family. You're looking at a victim of that. It destroyed my life for a good, good year. I'm just barely pulling myself out of it right now. And I have breakdowns every week. Total breakdowns. You are not alone. You are not obscure. You're one of the masses that is being destroyed by our country right now. It's happening around the world. These stressors are, are hurting all of us. You have to be strong. You have to look at your family for support. And if they aren't there for support, then you need to get into a NAMI class right away because you will find support. Now these numbers were 2019. If I read them today, it would probably even blow me away because I know how bad they are. Every week I hear about somebody who took their life. I had a call from somebody, very, very good friend of mine, and one of their friends took their life. And they just needed to vent to me. I was glad to help them. It happened just a couple days ago. It's unreal. I was glad to help this, this person, this friend of mine. Really glad. He's a great person. And he was one of the few people in my world that called me regularly after Ben took his life. And there's too many people out there who won't do that. If you know someone who's taken their life, 
you call their family. They need that call. They need you to ask the questions. How are you? What can I do for you? You must feel horrific. Can I come over and let you lean on my shoulder? I know it's not the most comfortable thing to do. But friends, as, as a village, we need to help each other. We need to be that support mechanism for others because it's a horrific scenario. Next letter. Good evening, Dave. I hope this finds you well and in as good a spirits as expected. I know I forgot to check which email I was going to refer to. So you may not realize it, but uh, I did put this together. I've shared this before. My sister of 48 died two years ago. Her death certificate said pulmonary embolism, but her husband had died of an overdose six months earlier. She stopped taking her Levenix blood thinner shots. As a family, we will never know if she planned on the outcome of death for her, for her kids. We don't discuss that. My nephew found both their bodies. I can't imagine the hell he goes through. My German Shepherd suddenly died the next month. The pain is real. It took a year to bring my other German Shepherd out of depression. She's now 12. It will be hard to say goodbye to her as well. After my sister died, my dad mentioned that she would send you his hunting stories, which had led me to your channel and your books. I felt a somewhat kindred connection with you. I learned a lot. I learned to expand my pool of knowledge. I learned to try and live again. Although I don't think I've gotten there yet. She was my only sibling and the only person that shared my childhood with me. That's hard. I thank you for what you were trying to accomplish and for putting mental health and suicide awareness in the forefront. Between you and I, without the facts, which I know are important, looking back on the historical accounts, the Fae, mythology, the Bible, and other sources, I believe your answers are there. We are not alone. I've never been alone. And those beings can meld with nature and teleport from dimension to a dimension. The possess for a magic or science beyond a comprehension. For what it's worth, there's my hypothesis. I wish you well. I'd like to leave you with some parting words. Do not stand at my grave and weep. I'm not there. I'm not asleep. I'm a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glints on the snow. I am the sunlight on ripened grain. I am the gentle autumn rain. When you awaken in the morning's hush, I am the sudden uplifting rush. On the circling birds in a quiet flight, I am the soft stars that shine at night. Do not stand at my grave and cry, I am not there, I did not die. Every person you reach, Dave, every person you don't know that you have saved, Ben made that possible. I know. His purpose moves through you. Yet I know it's a heartbreak that will never be filled. Thanks for reading my letter. Although lacking important details that my sister wanted to get to you so many years ago, but didn't know if you saw them. Now she knows. Godspeed, Godspeed, God bless. May you be surrounded by the light of God. May you be. See what I'm saying, folks? It's horrible. It's horrible. It's freaking horrible. I'm surrounded by pictures of Ben in here. And I know he supports me. For I know I wouldn't have been here without him. I'm grateful for that. But if I had to forego this to have him here, of course, without a doubt. Rather be fishing with him on a river. Next letter. 
show my gratitude. I'll be as brief as possible. Here's how my sci-fi book background can explain most of the profile points. Number one, any travelers visiting us would know how to sterilize our germs and viruses as such as they could safely interact with us. Part of this procedure would involve our clothing and shoes as well as cleansing that would be by nature eliminate our scent. That would also explain why the cattle mutilations are ignored by insects and predators. No scent to attract them. I've said that a hundred times. Removed or missing shoes could also be the result of sterilization. However, it occurs. The oldest written description of this is from Ezekiel in the Bible when he describes being brought to the wheel. Number two, granite and water may simply be simpler for their crafts to stabilize and hover above. When observed, UAPs appear, UAPs, UFOs, appear to dart around almost as if they aren't in perfect control. When we went to the moon, we discovered something called mass cons, which were areas beneath the moon's surface that caused this orbiting spacecraft to noticeably dip closer to the moon when they passed above them in their orbits. Perhaps they use these large areas of water, granite, or boulder fields because those areas make it easier for their ship's guidance, guidance when hovering. Three, weather. After disappearance may be the result of a craft that uses vacuum point energy for propulsion. In theory, may also account for a rapid change in temperature, which would result in the normally, which would result in the normally air-supported moisture to suddenly condense, falling as rain or snow, which would also create strong winds. We can't do this yet, but it is possible to achieve within the physical laws that we already know about. Four high levels of the tranquilizer GHB may indicate this is the drug they use to collect their specimens without immediately killing them, since it wouldn't affect paralyze them. Number five, falling from great heights may simply indicate that they didn't have time to land after being done with their specimens. It may indicate that they wish to avoid detection, so flee rather than be detected. Before I go on, remember us, uh, Star Trek series? Remember when uh, Kirk would say, yeah, beam me, He'd take out his phone and say, beam me up, Scotty. And the beam would come down, grab him, and bring him up to the spaceship. Well, in that series, it started in the port on the ship, if you wanted to go to a planet. And they would beam him down to the planet. What if they beamed him down to the planet, and it was on the side of the hill, or on the edge of a cliff, and they'd end up falling, dying? Makes you think. Skinwalker Ranch events, and in particular the punishments inflicted, may indicate clear and obvious demonstrations of exactly who was in charge and what they do not want done or revealed while avoiding any direct contact with us. Six, being found later in areas that were previously searched indicates that they were taken and were examined at another location and later returned to the approximate same area. As you have correctly pointed out, human criminals would never take this unnecessary risk. No, they never would. And it's ridiculous to think that somebody could get back inside of a search zone without canines picking that up. Seven cluster zones are the result of the same sampling techniques that scientists use today. A random area is selected and defined, then every specimen that they are interested in within that area is collected and measured. Eight, altogether the profile points match perfectly with how our scientists now look for and measure species and their viability around the world. This is how they determine which species are endangered. They then look for the cause and what needs to be done to rebalance the ecology in order to repopulate the species. Perhaps the high IQ are being selected for eventual repopulation either here or elsewhere as we now do with seeds and livestock. Selection for this intelligence trait may also be why those with German ancestry are often abducted. Perhaps this isn't the first time we were introduced here, and the last time it was in the area we know as Germany. Germanic peoples have produced some amazing and very technical products and machines. 
In my humble opinion, sci-fi stories are based upon fantastic inventions that are theoretically possible but not yet invented. I don't think that any of the above ideas are much of a stretch, especially considering what has just recently been revealed to us about UAPs or UFOs. Our government originally admitted to 140 unexplained, uh, likely not us reports, but just this week has upped it to more than 400 reports and they haven't really started collecting them yet. I believe that your research will assist us in understanding what the UFOs are doing and eventually why they are doing this. Thanks for creating such a thought-provoking, potentially very critically important community. I always look forward to your next video. Well, thank you for the very compelling letter. Now, I know some of you have just turned off because some of you don't like to think about UFOs, aliens, these kind of things. Some of you are so inbred with crypto topics, Dogman, Bigfoot. What if all those topics were all related to what we're talking about right here? What if they were? That would probably cause your head to spin. Sometimes I, I do believe that almost all these topics have to be related because they are so obscure. Now, I don't mean that one race of aliens is doing everything, because that doesn't really make sense. Because if there's billions and billions of planets out there in the solar system universe, then how many people like you and I could be sitting in another planet doing something very similar to what we're doing right now? Or, again, as I've said, are we the ant, the ant farm and people are watching us and learning and studying our behavior? And it's maybe they're trying to figure out who are the weak, who are the strong, who are the smart, who are the ones that could thrive in depressive times? Those are the leaders that they'd want, maybe. Or do they want people that are just a specific look? Do they want blue-eyed people? I have no idea. But you got to keep your mind open. Now, to me, it seems like it would be very superfluous if they went off looks. But again, if they were looking for super smart people, physicians, physicists, engineers, then that might make a little more sense. Next letter. Hey Dave, I enjoy your Skinwalker Ranch info. Let's stop right there. Every week I'm doing a segment on Skinwalker Ranch. Now I did one last week that had some great reviews. So you might want to go back and watch that segment if you haven't already. And Tuesday nights on the History Channel, they have the Skinwalker Ranch series. I would say that we are dealing with good against evil. So many connections between telepathy with us and other beings, entities. People have one experience with, say, dog man outside their house and inside cupboards are slamming by an unseen force. Things that aren't possible by our understanding become reality. It's a huge rabbit hole, trying to keep it short. There's also a connection to meditation and development to become aware. It'd be great if you could come and do a talk in Calgary. Friends, I go where I'm invited that there's a conference. If it's a big conference, say there's four or 500 people, then my fee to go is pretty low. Why? Because I, I know I can make it up selling books that I'll ship up there. Now, if you have a small conference, well, then I'm going to have to charge you a little more for my time and getting there and room and board and such. But if I'm invited to a conference, I generally go. I don't go to all the conferences I'm invited to, but uh, generally you'll find me at a cryptid conference, at a UFO conference, paranormal conference. Yeah, those are just the ones I get invited to. And if I'm, they're kind enough to invite me, then I'll go. 
But uh, I haven't been invited to Calgary. I've been to Toronto a couple times. Love Canada. I think that's the only conference I've ever done in Canada. But uh, Skinwalker Ranch, a very unique place. You will find me in front of the TV every Tuesday night watching it. And immediately afterwards, I'll be getting up a video that will review it. So uh, watch it. It'll be ready. That's on top of the uh, new segments I do and the missing persons videos. Now, uh, I want everyone to uh, take a deep breath. And think about how would you react if someone you heard was very close to you, relative, best friend, disappeared. They were on a backpacking trip and they wouldn't they didn't come back. What would you do? How would you respond? Would you try to get involved? At those times of great stress, especially if you're a family member and it, your sister, brother disappeared, at those times of, of great stress, you can't replicate every minute that's lost. You've got to think clearly, analytically, and be of assistance. And everybody can help. Uh, one of the things that I have done in the past for families that have suffered this is they need a family advocate to represent them. And what I mean by that is they need someone outside the immediate scope of their family to be the point person for all press, all police, all search and rescue. The reason being is that that person can stand stoically and make good rational presence for you. Also, if that person has gone through what you've gone through, they can be an immense assistance. Now, one person that I have, I have referred many people to, and he's talked to many families for me, is Alan Adadero. Alan is truly a gift from God. I gotta say it. It was a fluke we met, and from that very first meeting, we've been best friends. Alan lost his four-year-old son, Jared, in the mountains of Colorado. And no fault of his. But Alan went through the exact same thing that every other family has gone through. He knows that the press will lie. He knows that the sheriff will lie sometimes. <laughs> He knows it's one of the most hellish times of a parent's life. And Alan went without an answer for four years until some remains were found in the mountains of Jared. And still, the press tried to fry him by lying. In that first movie we did, Missing 411, you can watch it on YouTube. The center point of that story was Jared Adadero. And Jared still has many questions about what really happened to him. But Alan Adadero, I think one of his reasons he's still here is to help others. He's such a good person. And Alan has written a couple of great books about the disappearance of Jared. And if you just Google or go to Amazon and type in Alan, A-L-L-Y-N, Adadero, A-T-A-D-E-R-O, you can find his books. They're really, really good books. And the hell he has encountered along the way. He's been at a couple of conferences I put on. He's come and spoke. He's an outstanding speaker. And uh, if I can get him back up here for another conference, I'd for sure bring him up. Okay. On to the stories. 
So the first one, let's see what we got here. First one is an incident that happened in Colorado. Dr. William James, unknown age. He was a Pueblo, Colorado physician. Pueblo is a couple hours south of Denver. He went missing October 19th, 1936, near Carbondale, Colorado. Dr. James went and took a short hunting vacation. First, he went alone to a city called Dot Soto, and he went deer hunting. And then after that, he drove up to a place called Glenwood Springs and met some friends and spent the night with them. If you've never been to Glenwood Springs, you need to go. They've got a great hot springs there. It's really nice. So, <clears throat> the doctor spent the night with his friends and said he was going to go out grouse hunting the next day and that that night he would be back and spend the next night with them as well. And uh, late that next day, October 19th, he didn't come back. Alarm bells really didn't start to go off with the friends because they thought maybe he was staying with friends in Carbondale. But by the next night, nobody had heard from him and they started to call the sheriff and the state police. Well, on October 21st, the sheriff found his car adjacent to the Spring Gulch Mine, about two miles outside of Carbondale. I'll show you where this is. So, this is Glenwood Springs, Colorado. This is the mine. This is Carbondale. Now this area is much, much more developed than it was at, in, uh, at the time this happened. If you're a skier, this is Snowmass, Colorado over here. So you can kind of get a feeling. Now the distance from the mine to Carbondale, about two miles, pretty close. So the sheriff finds the call car, there's the key. They go into the car, and they find everything's there except a shotgun, which makes 100% sense. It's hunting for grouse. So they started to pour all their resources into that. The U.S. Forest Service showed up. The uh, Everybody you can imagine was coming to help, because this is a big-time physician. Uh, the f they sent in 50 CCC workers. They brought in canines from local jurisdictions. Canines didn't pick up a cent. That first night they started to search, a big storm came in and hit the area. Well, after five days of searching, they didn't find anything. So they called it off. Well, the family had money. And on November 9th, they hired a hunting guide that the family knew as an outdoorsman. They figured he could find them. And he hired other people, and they went into the woods for another week. Again, outside Carbondale, around the mine. Didn't find a thing. November 22nd, this is the third search, looking for Dr. James. They brought in canines. They brought in about a hundred different people. And on December 3rd, the final search was over. Dr. William James, unknown age, from Pueblo, Colorado, had disappeared. He was never found. How many times do I tell you this, folks? Well, about 30 miles down the road, as you go east from Glenwood Springs, you get to Vail, Colorado. And in Vail, I talked to you about the disappearance of another physician, Dr. McGrogan. And you can watch that video that Ben and I did when we went on scene where McGrogan disappeared and where he was located. 
It is one of the most strange cases I've ever researched. Ben and I really humped that day to get in there where he was found. I won't give you the details because we did a lengthy video about it. It's in a gorgeous place and uh, you like watching outdoors. So if you look at the screen you're looking at now and right at the bottom left it says Can-Am Missing Project, click on that and that'll take you to all of our videos. And if that still didn't take you to all the videos, look at the screen and it'll say videos, click on that and then you get them all. And you may have to go to the bottom of the page and click next page to get to the videos. But McGrogan's case, if you look at the uh, screenshot, it's a completely black screen with his photo on it. Ben did all that work on it, did a great job. So two physicians within a reasonable distance of one another in Colorado. Very strange cases. Now the next case, Fred Kramer. Now Fred was hiking with the Sierra Club. Very famous group. Went missing July 19th, 1961. One article, or five articles said he was 55, and five articles said he was 59, so not quite sure how old he really was. But he joined the Berkeley Sierra Club. He lived in Oakland, California, and he was a wholesale salesman for a liquor distributor in Oakland. Now, the Sierra Club was going on an outing to Washington State. And what happened was, is that his wife and his daughter decided to go with him. And that was great. They enjoyed that. They wanted to go. And there's a lot of very, very remote places in Washington. Many people don't realize this. And a lot of that state has a lot of elevation above Timberline where there's snow there all year. Now in this instance, they were going to stay at a Sierra Club camp and hike round trip to a place called Cascade Pass, North Cascade Pass, then turn around and come back. And there was about 16 people in the group. Again, his wife and daughter were there. And it wasn't an extremely difficult hike. They hiked up a valley to Cascade Pass, took a break, and then hiked back down. Now, earlier in the year, Fred Kramer had a heart attack. Now, this is 1961, fairly advanced. Well, the doctors gave him the clearance to go ahead and go and take a hike, and he was going to recover. So the wife and daughter weren't really worried about it. So the group was returning, and Fred was in the back three, one of the back three people in the group. And somewhere between the pass and Doubtful Creek, Fred disappeared. How could that happen? Well, they got back to the Sierra Club camp. I'll show you where that was. So this is the area they started in. This is the area of the camp. And this is Cascade, North Cascade Pass. And you go up this valley. It's about three or four miles, about eight miles round trip, but it's an easy hike. Well, somewhere in this area, within a very short distance, probably a half mile of the pass, Doubtful Creek, is the area where he disappeared. He was at the back of the group, they came down from the pass, and then boom, he's gone. So, this was a weird case. They knew exactly the area that he was lost in, and they knew exactly where to send search and rescue. Well, the Shaylin County Search and Rescue Team was sent, the sheriffs, and the Kenan team. U.S. Forest Service responded, and 80 search and rescue people end, ended up there the next day searching. There was a one-week search and rescue for Fred Kramer. They never found any of his belongings, 
Bloodhounds never picked up a scent. He had a disability. And earlier in my career of doing this, I had a whole series of cases where people were in a group and there was four or five people in line, eight or nine people in line, and they were at the back of the pack and boom, they disappeared. The Huffington Post did an article about my work and the title was, Don't Be Last in Line. It's not a funny topic and there's no doubt that there's some truth to this. Think about it. If you're in the middle of the group and you're surrounded by people, it would be very hard and difficult to take you without someone noticing something. But if you're at the back of the group, there's no eyes on you, which means that something could happen, take you out, and nobody would ever know anything, which happened to Fred it happened to many others that I've written about over the years. So when we talked about, let's say, targeted portals, if somebody was looking for an opportunity to take you, when everyone started walking and all the eyes are looking forward and Fred's at the back and no eyes are on him, they could direct a portal to take him out. Some people would say, well, if there's a serial killer, then that's the time they could run over and take him out and tackle him. And what are you going to do with them? If you're going to drag them away, there's going to be drag marks in the dirt. Nobody, unless you're Superman, is going to carry anybody that's 200 pounds very far at all at seven or 8,000 feet. I guarantee you that. So the issue with Fred Kramer is that there's no easy answers about where he could go. Nobody said he was suicidal. Everyone said he was high on life. He was looking forward to the hike. Nobody said he was feeling ill. Hmm. Okay. The next case was a stunner. <laughs> when I first researched this, I spent days on it. First couple days just seemed like a normal, mundane hunting trip that went bad. But yet as I went on, it got more and more intriguing. I doubt that you've ever heard of this case. I doubt that anyone's ever written about this case. But now, as I've said before, everyone will be talking about this case and all these channels will be putting it on thinking it's theirs. So look at the date and say, Dave broke the case. Two men, Ben Sweezy and Bill Weaver. Both men, Deputy U.S. Marshals for the state of Alaska. Missing October 30th, 1917. Now, if you're going to turn this off at this point because of the date, you're a fool. Goodbye. I really don't want you here because I need critical thinkers because just because something happened 100 years ago, that does not make it irrelevant today. So, both are from Anchorage, and both had spent time in Seaward, Alaska. And there they had Sweezy's boat, and they were going to go hunting for two weeks in Alik Bay, A-I-L-I-K Bay. Now, some articles said it, they were going to go hunting for a month. Others said two weeks. From the data of the response from the search and rescue, it appears that two weeks is the correct time frame. So they get onto Sweezy's boat. And they go around a point and they go into the bay. So they started in Seaward. And they went out in the boat and they went around this point and then went into Alec Bay. Here's Anchorage up here. Now the distance from here to here not that far and I'll give you a reference point in a second. This is the point they had to come around and to give you an example 
from this point to this point, it's only two miles. So, let's get into the definition of the men. Sweezy. This is October 30th, 1917. They never gave ages on both men. But here's what they said about Sweezy. His family homesteaded Alaska. They were tough. They knew the country. He was one of the toughest, smartest, most knowledgeable outdoorsmen in the state of Alaska. That's what was said about him. Now, Weaver, he was born and raised in San Bernardino, California, Southern California, and he transferred to Anchorage with the U.S. Marshal's Office. Now, I really don't care what you think, because I've dealt with these men and women. The U.S. Marshals, in my humble opinion, is the best federal law enforcement arm imaginable. They are the group that goes out and gets all of the people that are wanted and warrants, etc. And they do a lot of protection work. Now, in this instance, Sweezy and Weaver were going hunting together. They work together, they were best friends. They're going to go out into the woods, spend two weeks hunting in the middle of nowhere. And truthfully, friends, that was the middle of nowhere, and it's still the middle of nowhere where they went. So they leave, they say goodbye to their friends, in two weeks we'll be back, blah, blah, blah. They leave Seaward in Sweezy's boat. November 1st, nobody's heard from them. So friends organized the Josie O boat. They got eight people and they went to the bay, Alec Bay, and they searched for him. They searched for two weeks. They came back November 15th. They hadn't seen anything. They haven't found anything. They had nothing to report. So that was on November 15th, November 22nd. In that week's time, the government wanted to do a big push to find these men. They weren't sure if they'd be alive or not, but they wanted to understand if there was some kind of criminal element that might have taken them out. Did these two guys happen to see a poacher in there and try to arrest him? Um, was there some type of drug activity or a still going on in the backwoods there? I have no idea what they might have found. So, the federal government gets a hold of a captain named Iverson. And they give Captain Iverson 100% federal authority. Arrest, search, seizure, everything. And they gave him 10 people. And they went on a boat and they went out into the area near Alec Bay to search. Weather was rough, cold, and they knew that they were looking for a needle in the haystack, and they were. They weren't sure which beach they were gonna to go to. They weren't sure if they were gonna stay one. Sometimes you make a hunting camp on one beach, and then for the day you go to another part of the bay to hunt. They didn't know. There were a lot of small islands in that area. But they started searching, and they searched a lot of area. They found a lunchbox that they thought belonged to one of the men, but they weren't 100% sure. And then they found a seat that they were pretty sure belonged to Sweezy's boat, but nothing else. So the theory was that they ran into a huge storm on their way up, except they didn't run, they didn't leave during a huge storm. So that was tough to reconcile. Other people have said that other fragments from the boat were found, but that was never proven, and it was never, it was just circumstantial evidence. And everyone believed that Sweezy and Weaver together, their combined intellect, could have overcome almost anything in the outdoors. Now, in Alaska, in 1917, 
you had to be good on land and you had to be really good on water because a lot of the area in a land in Alaska meant crossing water, floating rivers, crossing bays and creeks. Now they had to cross a bay here. Sweezy had a boat and he had used it for years. Now remember what I told you what people thought of Sweezy. I honestly can't remember too many other instances where law enforcement people were talked about in such high esteem. But they did in this one. Now, three different searches. The third one found some remnants. Nothing substantial. No body, no rifles. No supplies. A lot of things float. A lot like the seat on the boat, was probably a life preserver. A lot of food items float. But they didn't find much. And according to some, they just found fragments. And again, remember, they didn't leave in a storm. And that goes to Sweezy and Weaver's intellect in making smart decisions. There's only one other time I've ever written about anything close to this, and that was in Maine. Two Maine game wardens went out to look for poachers in far northern Maine and wrote about this in Missing 411 Eastern U.S., and they disappeared. Nobody could believe it. What they said about those two men was the same thing they said about Sweezy and Weaver. It could have been the same, same scenario. But what bothers me about this is that there were no easy answers. A lot of people disappear in boats in Alaska. Hundreds, thousands over the years. And I've never gone after and written about any of those. What convinced me to write about this is what they said about these two men and how well acclimated they were to the outdoors. Do I believe that they ran into a storm and then sunk out in the middle of the bay? Uh, no. Here's why. Because anyone who's smart knows that when it gets really rough, what do you do? You head for land and you ride it out on land, which is what Sweezy would have done. They wouldn't have pushed forward. They wouldn't have risked their lives they would have done the smart thing. And my heart tells me that that's what they did. Now maybe a big storm came up and swept the boat out to the sea, to the ocean, to the bay, and broke it up. But where are these men? And it would have been so easy to miss a camp on the amount of landfall that they had to search that I don't blame searchers for not finding it. So, only two instance, instances I've known of in 120 years of doing this kind of span of research for law enforcement, only two times have two people in law enforcement disappeared at the same time. Very, very strange. What's even stranger to me is that this story has never been talked about on any show. I'm sure it will be now in any series. But I'm glad I could tell it to you now. These men ought to be held in reverence for what they did at a time in 1917 in Alaska. The wildest place probably in the United States for lawlessness, no assistance. They couldn't radio and get more help. Hard to believe. So we covered a lot of ground and uh, I appreciate you listening to me. Please understand that 
I really do take these disappearances to heart. When you think about William James, a physician, never found, never found in Colorado. Fred Kramer, on a Sierra Club outing, in a line, a long line of people, disappears. And if he had a bad heart and had a heart attack, canines would have found him, search and rescue would have found him, he wouldn't have been far off the trail. He's never found. And then two U.S. Marshals assigned in Anchorage, Alaska, disappear and are never found. It had to have destroyed the Anchorage office. Probably, they probably only had a handful of marshals there. So, if you could pass this on to your friends, I'd, I'd greatly appreciate it. Um, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. And you can follow me, Can Am Missing, David Politis at Can Am Missing on Twitter. And you can watch my videos free on YouTube, uh, Missing 411 and Missing 411 The Hunted. So I tried to do that for you. And there's going to be links below this video for where you can get my books. Don't buy them online from Amazon, eBay, etc. You're going to pay way too much. You're going to get ripped off by resellers. They're charging upwards of $100 for my books online. You can buy it for me for $24.99. So, thank you very much for being here. The village is a special place, and your knowledge base is growing. And uh, I hope we can keep going. Go do something, anything nice for someone. It'll make you feel good inside, and it'll make their day. Politis out.